Thank you for joining me today on Side by Side. And we are going to continue our journey through Proverbs for another few days. I wonder if I was to ask you the question, what is the root from which every good springs up? What is the source from which every good grows? The thing that if a person nurtures above everything else in their life, that they will be assured of greatness in the eyes of anyone who matters, but especially to God. What am I speaking of? I'm not speaking of self-worth or self-esteem, which is the trend of the 21st century if you want to get ahead. But I'm speaking of humility. Humility is seldom, if ever, the goal of people's lives. Instead, it's much more likely to be self-assertion, control, influence, visibility. They're much more the direction of travel that people have. Alongside humility, there are some cousins belonging to it. Cousins like teachable, openness, listening, waiting, resting. And Proverbs has so much to say about these things. Indeed, the Bible has endless wisdom about humility and its arch enemy, pride. And since Proverbs teaches us, and I quote, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, then that we can say is the humble reverence for God is the beginning of wisdom. It certainly is placing humility at that central place or the root from which all good springs up. Depending on who we listen to, we hear the message today. You must assert yourself. You must demand. You should claim. You must hit back or you must fight back. And that doesn't really get us very far, does it? We see a world where people with this sense of demanding and asserting creates all sorts of problems and conflict and pain. Take, for example, Pharaoh in chapter 5 and following of Exodus. There we have Moses who goes into the wilderness, he says, he wants to go into the wilderness to hold a feast to the Lord. That's as he is commanded by God in obedience to, his, to, to, to Yahweh. But what is the response of Pharaoh? He says, and I quote, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? You can just hear the arrogance in Pharaoh's heart and mind. Who is the Lord? that I should go. In other words, he's nothing. He's no one. He's of no value. He's of no wit. I am much more important in my own eyes. And I think that well describes the spirit of the same man all the way until his own firstborn and the firstborn in all of Egypt are found to have died in the night when the angel passes over. That's where pride gets us. Now the classic for me is Daniel chapter 4. That's where Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. It's it's a very disturbing dream to him. He, He describes it this way. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity, but one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. And so he brought all the wise men. Of course, they couldn't tell him, but then Daniel, who he calls Belshazzar, comes and tells him this, the meaning of this mystery Belshazzar, Daniel says, I wish that the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my lord, and not to you. And then he describes that this tree is like Nebuchadnezzar's own empire growing up. And then it's cut down and destroyed. And of course, it's a picture of Nebuchadnezzar too, who rises up in a sense of self, self-worth and influence and power and control when he's cut down. But at the end of that, there is an appeal, an appeal from Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar. And he says this, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. Here's a man who is, as we described, full of self-assertion, self-control, his own influence, his own power. And he, he's, get, he's, he's receiving this warning. 
but he has felt it because it made him tremble. He is also given the wisdom of this very skilled, gifted man that God has placed in the empire, Daniel. And he doesn't listen. This sense of pride that is more prominent in his heart like Pharaoh. And, and what happens? Read on because this is a very powerful, powerful illustration of this. Twelve months later, King Nebuchadnezzar was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. And as he looked out across the city, he said, Ah, look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer the ruler of the kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals, and you will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. And that same hour, the judgment was fulfilled and he was driven from human society and he lived among the animals like a, a disturbed man. Wow. Isn't that powerful? It really does express the truth that you find in Proverbs 28, verse 14, which says, Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens their heart will fall into calamity. That's a sad story, isn't it, of someone who stands out in history so powerfully and so clearly, where humility would have made all the difference. For when you read on, there's a great hopeful verse, and I love this phrase in verse 34. After the time passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshipped the Most High and honoured the one who lives forever. What a wonderful thing to see this man. When he did humble himself, how blessing came back into his life, and it did. And it seems... Verse 36 talks about my sanity returned and so did my honour, glory and my kingdom. I was sought out and I was restored. Yeah, you see, the first word in that section of Proverbs 28 verse 14 says, Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. The word blessed, oh the day, oh the joy or the delight. You see, contrary to the way people think, humility is the way of great blessing. And we see that so powerfully in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. For as Jesus is the wisdom of God, he shows us everything about wisdom, doesn't he, in his life. Philippians 2 tells us that though Jesus was God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he took upon himself the nature of a servant. He humbled himself, became obedient, obedient unto death, the death of the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ in his humility, was then lifted up. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. Because Jesus humbled himself, he has been made it possible for us to be lifted up to be his brothers, sisters, children of God. I finish with a little story. It was a story of a pastor in Canada who was visiting the churches and stayed in a guest house and the lady in the guest house described about someone who was there, a maid who was very disturbed and depressed. And when she spoke to the pastor, he said this to her, because he could discern perhaps what was going on in her heart. He said, here's a prayer to pray. Show me myself, O Lord. Now, she continued to pray that for some time, and on his journeys, they met again. She was even more miserable. And he then said to her, and I'm of course shortening the story down for the sake of time, he said, now, don't pray that prayer anymore. Pray this, show me thyself, O Lord. To which she then continued. God, having revealed that she was much worse than they shot than she first thought, which is true, then reveals how gracious he was as she humbled himself, herself before him. And that was the blessing that brought her to the place where she could experience, experience great peace. As the Word of God says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and He will lift you up in due season. 
Let's pursue humility with energy today.